I'm going to kick things off here by uh, uh, doing a, a few slides that represents a part of what I did at the University of Cincinnati when, when I was there. So I used to do a proposal writing workshop um, at least a couple of times a, a year. And so we've kind of distilled some of uh, that material out uh, to, to start off here. And uh, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk about, about those issues. So I want to start here with a, uh, a quote that I, I have paraphrased and stolen from the world of sports. Uh, there was a, a very famous coach that was once asked at the end of a game where his team had won a, a great victory, well, do you think in the end it just came down to the will to win? And this coach said, well, everyone has the will to win. The real key is who has the will to prepare to win. And I think in proposal writing, that's, um, well, I have, I'm stuck here anyway, so <laughs> I'll put this down here for now. I'll hand it to Sergio. Sure. I think this is a really important point. I, I as a couple of examples here, I uh, remember uh, talking to a, a friend a while back who was single and very much wanted to be married, but really didn't want to put the time into meeting people, was tired of dating, and it was like, well, sorry, <laughs> that's the deal. You've got to put that time in. Or I had a recent co conversation with a colleague who had uh, aspirations to be a university administrator, but said, well, it's so much problem to go through all these interviews and apply for these jobs, and it's like, well, that's what it's going to take. And I think proposal writing is like that as well. If you want to be successful, you have to accept that you're going to have to put in t the time to, to be successful. Um, I think there are four components to a competitive proposal. Uh, given my experience with uh, reviewing proposals, and I've had quite a bit of it, uh, both at the university and the national sort of context, and so I've, I've listed those four uh, areas here, and I just want to talk about uh, each of them in turn. So the first one's the, the problem. Um, basically, this is the large, the broad domain, the context where um, you're intending to do a project. And um, there are a couple of pieces of advice, I think, that I wanted to pass along in terms of what really makes a compelling proposal. Um, one is you've got to connect with something large, some big picture. If the proposal seems like it's very narrow uh, and too specific, and a lot of us do our work in those fairly narrow areas, so you know we're familiar with that, um, it's really unlikely to be successful. It's got to somehow connect to something larger. Proposal writing is persuasive writing. You have to persuade the audience that you're doing something that's worth doing. And um, it's a highly competitive uh, activity, as you probably all know. Uh, I remember uh, at a proposal writing workshop that we used to do, again, back at Cincinnati, there was a photograph of proposals coming into the loading dock at NIH on the day proposals were due. And I mean, it was this gigantic room filled, ceiling to floor, full of proposals, and it had a little arrow that said, your proposal here. You've got to stick out somehow. You've got to have a review committee advocate for you. How are you going to do that? So one of the pieces of advice is connecting with this, this uh, big picture and, and with the reviewer. So you are writing for those reviewers and uh, not for some other audience. So that's another critical feature that I think uh, is going to come up in the talk today is that relationship, cultivating that relationship with the reviewer. So I just has a, have an example here. How do you do that? So for uh, most of us are working in fairly narrowly defined areas where we've developed this finely honed expertise. How do you connect to the broader problem? And I think part of it is just thinking about some problems differently. So I have this uh, uh, photograph here of a mosquito and this is a, a, one of the species that carries the Zika virus. Okay, so when I did this a few years ago, I had this was bird flu slide. Here's an issue that's on people's mind. How do we connect to that? Well, you, you might think of that as a very narrow problem, but in fact, there are aspects of the problem of dealing with uh, Zika virus that have to do with anthropo uh, anthropology and cultural practices. There are economic issues about 
who trades with who. There are issues of transportation that come up in terms of, you know, where do planes fly and how do these, what the vectors are for these viruses. The sociology, if you think about uh, various sorts of strategies for um, uh, how it is you're going to contain the, uh, the virus, the psychology, individual folks, how do they think about their chances of being infected, and then international relations issues. So there are all of these different domains that uh, become relevant if you were working in any of those related to this outbreak of, of Zika. So that's a, an example of how you connect, connect to this, this bigger uh, uh, issue in a proposal. Um, another, uh, another dimension here that I think is uh, a critical and a successful uh, proposal is the approach. Basically, how are you going to come at this problem or this issue? Um, and this is where a lot of that hard work comes in, and this is the part I think most of us are familiar with because it means that you're reading the literature, you're looking at other people's proposals, you're really tuned in to what's going on in not only your discipline, but maybe in some allied disciplines so that you're in a position to be able to see when there's a kind of a coalescing of approaches or technologies or whatever it might be that are going to inform a, a good uh, proposal. And um, again, from uh, some presentations I've heard in the past, I uh, uh, had a uh, uh, guy whose name was um, uh, Steve Howell, who used to do these, pro these proposal writing workshops, and he talked about being a paradigm pioneer in a book that he had read that talked about when you come in, and this analogy, and you're a settler, that's someone who comes in after everything's proven and safe, and you know the experiments are going to work, and that's not a place you want to be. That's the place where everybody can be. You want to be a paradigm, a pioneer. You want to be somebody who's pushing some ideas out there. Uh, probably all of you, since you're faculty and lived in this world, you know we're really addicted to novelty and to innovation and things being new. So those are elements of proposals that you really want to be able to, um, to use in, in designing a, a, a project. And then it's, it's got to be something about your past. So I just have this Uber emblem up here because I think they're a good example of there were these technologies emerging, there were these needs, people to get places, people who wanted jobs, getting them there, and so pulled those things together in a really um, uh, unique kind of way and, uh, saw, and had an approach that was um, really solving a particular kind of problem. So you have to have your own path that you develop in that, that regard. Um, for me, I'll just uh, I'll provide an example, a personal example. <clears throat> I was doing research on individual differences in food preferences. And what we were interested in was whether people who were less willing to try new foods and people who liked trying new foods actually approached the process of sampling foods differently. And so we had to develop a technology where we studied sniffing. So we went to all this effort to develop this sniffing technology uh, so that we could measure whether people who were going to say, no, I don't want to try that, sniffed at the food differently than people who actually were interested in trying new foods. They do, by the way. But as we were doing that, um, I also was familiar with uh, research that was being done on a connection between Alzheimer's disease and the sense of smell and realized that we could use that same technology to develop a test for whether or not you had a normal sense of smell and got a, a $3 million worth of NIH funding to develop this technique that I have here on this slide. So the whole idea that we had in the beginning was to study one problem and yet we were able to apply it to another problem because I was familiar broadly with the clinical literature that was related to the, this whole domain of sense of smell. Uh, the investigator. This is something else that um, you have to pay attention to. Not much you can do for yourself on this one sometimes. You are who you are. But somehow you want to convey that you're basically the perfect person to do the project. Or you've pulled together the perfect team to do the project. And as I write here, you, you've been preparing your whole life to do this. So you have to be building a set of credentials that make you credible um, uh, to do this. 
If you have specialized skills, obviously those are something you want to leverage. And if you don't have those skills, that's really going to make uh, it, it's really going to be a problem in the review uh, because uh, people are going to uh, downgrade the proposal on, on this basis. The other thing I want to mention is, and, and I think um, Rox is going to maybe talk a, a little bit about this too, you want to be applying to the right program. So are you in good investment as an investigator, as a young investigator, or as a senior scholar? And obviously, you know, what you look like in terms of your credentials is going to relate to that. But I've seen instances where a very junior faculty member will essentially apply for a lifetime achievement award kind of funding, and it's not going to work out. So you have to be the right investigator and have those right kind of credentials. And then uh, the setting. So where are you going to actually do this work? What are you going to bring to bear with respect to uh, access to materials, specialized equipment, colleagues who are on your team, uh, a location that might be advantageous. We just had folks here from Ecuador visiting, and there was lots of discussion about the assets that were available uh, if you were collaborating with people who were in Ecuador, um, or research populations. So here in Southeast Ohio, there are certain demographics that would advantage uh, someone who is working here in terms of the, the, the kind of folks who live here um, or the kind of species we might have here, those sorts of things. So you have to think about those things. And I have an example here. Basically, if you need a three-eyed frog for your research, then you better have access to three-eyed frogs or you can leverage that, right? So that if you have access to special populations of people or materials, or uh, organisms, that can be an advantage when you're uh, uh, writing your proposal. So uh, those are uh, some of the, uh, I think, very high and high uh, sort of top of mind uh, issues that I think you need to consider when uh, you're writing a proposal. Um, basically, it's the, having a big idea, having a good approach to it, being in a setting where you can carry off that work, maybe in a unique way, and then having built a personal profile that makes you look like you're the right person to do that, that piece of research. So I think uh, my part is done, and we're going to move on here to... Oh, sorry, I had one more slide. So this is just generally uh, some comments. Um, the first thing I had to write in proposal writing is that it's not like writing a scholarly paper. So my first grant proposal, I think the first page I had like, you know, 50 references. Uh, no, they don't do that. It's not a scholarly paper. It's something very different. And uh, the audience and the way that it'll be evaluated is very different. So you, you need to understand that um, um, the style of writing has to be different. As I was saying, you want to compete in your league. If you're a young investigator, you want to be applying to programs for folks like that. If you're a clinical investigator, you want to be applying to programs that are for clinical investigators to you know, be compared to people who would be similar to you. There's just a lot of work in this whole enterprise. You have to do it over and over. You get better. You adv you're advantaged by working with people who have a lot of practice and can share um, what they've learned in terms of simple things like formatting, um, how to actually get all those words into the page limit, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, people learn some things. Um, nobody, uh, I, maybe somebody in this room, but I certainly didn't bat a thousand with respect to proposal writing. If you look at success rates, there are a lot of rejection letters that go out, and you have to come to terms with that. Uh, we were talking a little bit the other day uh, in anticipation of today's um, uh, session with Sergio about we need a hotline, right? 1-800, my grant got rejected. And uh, so you can get that therapy when you get the bad news that your most wonderful ideas are not worthy. And you really just have to have the emotional uh, strength and fortitude to say, okay, and then we'll go back in. And I can tell you many people who were rejected many times but once you get the funding, it's really great. And there are things that you can do that you just simply couldn't have done otherwise. And then finally, and this is the hardest thing, and I was never successful doing this, 
maybe some of my colleagues can talk about this, cultivate a cadre of critics. And uh, uh, there's a reference here to George von Beckesy, who was a Nobel laureate, did work in, and actually a number of fields, um, but most particularly in the inner ear and how the cochlear uh, membrane works. And uh, von Beckesy said, well, when he was young, he had enemies. And he had two or three different labs that were always working against him. And so they really provided great criticism. And he could use that criticism to make his experiments better. But as he got older, everyone started to give him awards and became his friend, and they wouldn't give him criticism anymore. And so the real point is that it, this is not something that is easy in our culture um, to give criticism, especially Midwestern culture, uh, which I was at, you know, where I was for most of my career. But it's really useful to have somebody who will read your proposal critically. I had a very uh, esteemed and established colleague in, in my department. Um, it was a good friend, and I would give him my proposals, and it would come back with like commas and you know changes in tense. And it was like, no, that really isn't that. Thanks, but it's not that helpful. You really need somebody to be giving you feedback on the ideas. And this is something that you can uh, create you know, agreements basically with peers or more senior colleagues to actually give you that good feedback. You're going to get it from the reviewer. May as well get it before. And it's amazing how little it, it takes sometimes to fix a proposal. I sent my, I think, second proposal in. Uh, this was back in the days of NIH where they didn't triage, where they just didn't even score stuff. And I got this really bad score. And so I called the program officer and I said, well, I guess, you know, this was just not something that NIH is interested in funding. And I remember her saying, no, no, here, just change these few things. And I mean, they were trivial. It was literally 50 words. Double your sample size. I sent it back in and I got a 117, which is a really good score in NIH. So it went from horrible to really great. And if I had just had somebody give me a little advice before the thing went in, it would have probably been funded off the bat. So anyway, that's my uh, input, and I'm going to turn it over to Rox. I will advance you. <laughs> so now I get to figure out how to play with this technology for a minute. Okay. Yay, buttons work. Okay. Hi, I'm Roxanne Malay-Bruni. I'm from the research division. Normally I would be running around the place, you all know me, talking with my hands, but I'm going to try and stay put here and I'm going to try and get this to work for me. Uh, I'm going to try something very daring. I'm going to click on links and hope that they actually take me to those links. If not, well, we'll just have to imagine what those links would look like. Okay, so in the research division, the first thing I want to say is our long name is the Office for Research, Scholarship, and Creative Activity. So that means that we are inclusive of all disciplines, and that is really important for you all to know that arts and humanities, social and behavioral sciences, as well as life and biomedical sciences and physical sciences and engineering. I think I got them all. And so we have all of these different offices within our unit, uh, the Edison Biotechnology Institute, our new industry partnerships, Innovation Center, Internal Awards, Sponsored Programs, etc. Okay, here goes the participation part of the question. How many of you have interacted with somebody, somebody in my office? Raise your hands. Okay, great. For those of you who have not, that means that maybe you can turn around and talk to one of the colleagues who raised their hands and you can start talking. We try and be out on campus as much as we can, but sometimes you just have to come up to our tech. It's really good. Put on your Fitbit, come up the hill, back down the hill. Good for a couple steps for you, okay? One of the things that we do in our office is we invest in you as the faculty and staff and students. This year, we will be investing over $5.5 million in research and creative activity because we have our innovation strategy, which is one of our big programs. Okay, raise your hands. How many of you have benefited from the air travel program, for example? Has anybody gone to Washington, D.C.? Okay, let me tell you about this really briefly. The president turned over to the plane. They're done with the capital campaign. The plane is sitting on the tarmac. What to do, what to do? Well, rocks. How about if you allow faculty members to take it to 
Washington, D.C., and other places, as long as you have a minimum of four faculty members and there are nine seats total, you can take the plane for the day. You can even stay overnight. So you can go for conferences. You can talk to your research people. You can go and talk to sponsors. It's great. Basically, plane on demand. Uh, how about OURC or Baker? How many of our faculty have gone after our internal awards? OURC for new ideas, $8,000. Baker, up to $12,000 to complete a project. Great. If you haven't gone after one of these internal awards, absolutely come to me. Come to Karma West. But talk to the faculty members who raise their hands and ask them, hey, what did it take? We also had the Student Enhancement Awards and the PERFs and the Undergraduate Conference Travel. By the way, we're almost out of money for the uh, undergraduate travel. We have two more slots for this year, so if you have students, get them in quickly. And then we have our Infrastructure Awards, Conacher in 1804. Okay, I'll make you groan. How many people in this audience are preparing the Conacher proposal? Which is, yay, Sarah Wyatt. So, yeah, that's great. $5.5 million. Go ahead, grab it. And the other great thing about the internal awards, you know, your dean talked to you about how you have to build the capacity to write, inter uh, to write externally funded proposals, right? <laughs> the internal awards are sort of like that on training wheels because we write the guidelines very carefully. We tell you exactly what we're looking for. We give you feedback from the internal award committee. We also give you back uh, feedback from the external committees. So that allows you to get feedback and to hopefully write a more responsive proposal. Last question. How many of you in here have served on one of the internal award committees? Raise your hands high. Okay, Sarah, I know you've uh, been our OURC chair. You've also been on 1804. Go ahead. Uh, and Baker? Go ahead. Brian, what have you sat on? OURC. OURC? And so she's been on uh, Crisca, and she's done the Student Enhancement Awards. Anybody else? These are people who you want to talk to. So if you're looking for mock reviews for your internal awards, you already have some of that capacity within your own college. Definitely reach out to them. One of the things I want to talk to you about now, switching over, is Leo. If you're going to go after external funding, how do you find out who else has written to this agency before? Or if you want to know, you know, I'm working with these colleagues and it's kind of rude. I don't want to ask them what external funding they have. Well, you can look it up. Not so much that you're spying on them how much money they have to spend. No, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, is maybe they can give you advice on how to write a responsive proposal for that sponsor. So you can search by title. You can search by college, sponsor, department, investigator, fiscal year, program type, proposal status. All of these things. So... Here goes, first experiment, guys. Let's see what happens when I click here. Okay, clicking will enable all the hyperlinks. Sure, let's see what happens. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Mm -hmm. How many of you guys have been to Leo before? Okay, many of you, I bet, have gone there when you've had to fill out transmittal forms, right? But how many of you have gone in there to figure out you know, who might know a sponsor or who might be a good collaborator. Anybody do that? No? It's definitely something that you should be thinking about. So, let's see. Okay, you'll notice that in Leo I have a access to a few more things than you all do. But that's okay because you, you really you don't want access to all these things. Okay, so if you go into the ORSP database, and for some reason it is not showing up on the screen. Ah, I need to do something. I need to get my technical advisor. Well, I don't know, then I'll try. <laughs> uh, you gotta go, let's see, what is the mouse here? Do I need to go there? Let's see if that works, no. No? She let me... What I should do is I should say, everybody take out your phones. Everybody has phones, right? Leo yeah, is phone compatible, so we could do it that way, too. This thing is in a different... Uh-oh. Sorry. No. This is not bad, but when we get over to Pivot, it's going to be a problem if I can't get it up. Mm -hmm. No. Um, Tell you what, should we just go directly instead? Can yeah. we go to... Yeah, but is this the, the way that the... Um, 
the I tell you what. I need a, I need, I'm a Mac person and I'm trying to impersonate here a PC. Okay, well I tell you what, let's not even worry about this because I'm afraid it's going to take you, too long and yeah, we should just go pivot. It's, it's in, not It's in the display. The display. There you go. You want to duplicate and that's perfect. Thing. Okay. <clears throat> tell you what, there stay you here when I have there to get go. back. Stay okay. here. Okay. <laughs> How many PhDs does it take? No. Uh -huh. Sorry. Can't help that one. Okay. So we're now in Leo. And you'll notice that you can put in terms so you can search on the title. You can also look by sponsor. So, for example, here, let's try national. Oh, Nabisco. Everybody's interested in Nabisco, I'm sure. Um, but let's go to... Uh, I don't know. Let's go to National Science Foundation, one of my favorites. National Science Foundation. Well, basically, you can see what I'm getting at, right? We can go through all of these sponsors, and if you click on one, for example, and you were to hit search, it would say no records found. Boy, that wasn't a good example, was it, guys? Okay. You would think that it's if it's in here, or national, and, oh, that we should have some. Okay. So what it's telling you is, is that we've had three proposals go in. Once again, not a really great example, because you'll notice that over here in the funding record that we do not have any funded researchers, but I can tell you if I went to the National Science Foundation, which is where I should have gone first, we would have many. The other thing that you can do is you can look up an investigator. Is there anybody who we want to look up who is not here? Tell you what, uh, let's try Scott Miller because he's not here and we won't embarrass him. <laughs> okay, so if we look up Scott, you can see his track record. I know in a way that this might seem embarrassing, why is Rox doing this? The answer is because let's just say that you were really thinking about working with the Muskingum Valley Educational Service Center. You could go to Scott and he has expertise here. Okay? And so you could begin to look up who has expertise. The other thing that you can look up is funding source by year, etc. So, how many of you guys have been into Leo once again? How many of you guys have looked for uh, people to work with? Have I convinced any of you with this really bad example of not finding people who actually have funding? Sorry about that, but hopefully. <laughs> okay, but it really is worthwhile too. Okay, at this point, I'm going to shut this down and hope that we're back in here. So, over here. I don't want to start from the beginning, but I do want it to think. You. This one? Yeah. Slideshow. Okay. Yeah, once again, I'm not used to the PCs either. Uh-oh. Has stopped working. We have now killed the PowerPoint. You can just click out. Okay. Oh. We're going to try and recover. If not, I'm just going to say, that does it. It's not worth it. Okay. Yeah, close that. Okay. I don't think the computer is happy. Okay, great question. So if you go into Leo and you find somebody who has put in a proposal to that agency, will we give it to you? The answer is yes, if we ask the faculty member permission to share the proposal and they give it to us, yes, we can give that to you. 
We also have several faculty members who are willing to share parts of their proposals. For example, Sarah has uh, shared many of her broader impact sections with people. We also have people who have done the NSF career grants and also have data management sections who they are, you know, where they're willing to share. So yeah, go ahead. You can also, uh, if they are in as co-eyes, you'll be able to see them as well in Leo. But you won't be able to see key personnel. Any other questions before I move on? I'm going to try and be daring and open up another URL outside. OK, so pivot. We have a database that we used to be the community uh, of scientists. Um, and now it's called pivot. And the idea is, is that you can search hundreds of thousands of funding opportunities. It goes anywhere from grants to internships to fellowships. So it's not only the faculty and staff who are using this, but it's also the students. It includes US as well as foreign sources. So let's try it. Page I'm looking for does not exist. Boy, that's just a little scary. Okay, we're going to go in a different way, guys. Yeah, okay. But it's not showing up yet. Okay. Go ahead. So if The way I cheated and went in is I went into ohio.edu slash fellowships and then I clicked on search for fellowships. If you click on this link, which is the one in your PowerPoint, let's see if it works this time. Yay, okay. The first time that you use Pivot, you have to be at the university. You have to use your ohio.edu email. After that though, you can be anywhere, anywhere in the country outside the country, etc. So the first time you're gonna do, you're gonna log into Pivot. And you are going to, for the first time, sign up. When you sign up within the Ohio University IP address using your ohio.edu email, it will send you back an email conf uh, and you will just confirm. And then after that, as I said, you can be anywhere. When you type it in, you have to use your full ohio.edu email. Okay, this is where I need somebody to be brave. We're going to do an example for somebody today. Okay, so the first thing that I want you to do is when you come in is go into the advanced search. You will notice that there are two fields. There is the finding opportunity field and then there is the exclusion opportunity field. Do not fill them out backwards. I actually did this in a workshop once and I was wondering why we did not get any hits. Okay, so you definitely want to be in the matching opportunities. Many of you, when you are in a database for the first time, you're like, I know what keywords I want to search for and you try and enter them in here. But imagine how many operators must be putting in keywords into this. And the pivot database is very sensitive. If you have an S or without an S, ING, etc., it can really drive the system crazy. So one of the first things that I tell everybody is do not use those fields. Come down to the keywords instead. The first time that you're in here, you're going to want to browse. And you are going to open up the menu and you're going to see how they build their database sets. Somebody brave enough just to sh shout out their research area so I don't have to make one up? Please? Gravity. Okay. So, Sarah, if it's under gravity, do you, where is it going to most likely be? The natural and physical? Under here? <laughs> okay. Well, you can pick more than one. Let's just say that she wants to do gravity and she's doing graviotropism with plants. Okay, so she's going to come down here. If you click on this, it will add that to your search. But what I always tell people is if you can go at least one in, you will be better off. So under here, is it going to be under biological sciences? Stop me when you see something. Environmental sciences. Okay, let's go up to biology. OK, 
Okay, and we can click on that. Pick that one up too. Okay, so right now we have two keywords, but let's say that we do want to go back to gravity. When you type it in, don't hit the return. It drives the system crazy. I don't know why. Wait until it comes up. And then notice that it has this. So we can select that as well. So now we have three different searches, and these are all ors, not ands. Now, let's just say that you need a grant, and you know that you don't need a huge amount of money. Why would you tell the system that? Well, maybe you don't want to compete with the huge NIH NSFs, and you just need $5,000. Or maybe what you're doing, you need more than $5,000, so you are able to say less than or more than, so you're able to bound that. If you don't want, you can totally leave it blank. The same thing with the deadlines. I need something where I can get the money within the next eight months, or heck, I don't need it for a year. You can bound your study. Limited submissions, don't worry about that. That is just for the institution itself. It is not relevant to you. The reason why activity location is important is because a lot of times sponsors just don't fund the research project. They fund specific areas. Can anybody think of an example? Gates Foundation in Africa being one of them, for example. The ARC, Appalachian Rural uh, Regional Commission, Appalachia. So there are a lot of funding agencies that will fund in a particular area. So if you have a particular area, put it in. The system automatically assumes that you are a U.S. citizen, note up here. If you are not, unclick that box, and then you can go and you can put in your citizenship. Immediately, a lot of people are like, wow, that's not really fair. Honestly, for most funding agencies, they do not care for faculty members what is your nationality. It's more for students. However, there are times where you can get funding from your home country. And because Pivot actually looks at opportunities outside the US, we have several faculty who have identified opportunities from their home countries. Funding type. Okay. As soon as it decides to open. There we go. So now, you can ask yourself, Sarah, are you doing an artistic pursuit? Collaborative or cooperative agreement? Mm, dissertation? Nope. All of these? Probably not. But maybe you do want to, you know, get some money for a meeting or a conference. Prize or award is one of those catch-alls that I tell everybody to do. But I'm guessing you definitely want research in there. And you can go through and you can click travel, for example. And remember, all of these are ORs. And then the applicant type is very important. Who are you? First of all, are you a minority? You may be, you can click that. Are you a new faculty or new investigator? PhD, MD, or other professional? I will put that yes for you there. And are you a woman? Yes, Sarah, you are. Okay, sponsor type. Does anybody care where their money comes from? If you do, you can put in, do, I don't want money from this agency, or I do want money from this agency. Uh, it's amazingly, a lot of the students actually do care. Quite a few of them do. But faculty member? No, not so much. I Just give me the money. OK. <laughs> so then we hit the search. 2,830 results. Good luck. That will only take you a few days to get through. But I want to show you what Pivot does. It shows you where the opportunities are, wh how, what the breakdown is. Okay? And it begins to give you an idea. And one of the things that you might want to look at is how are you going to revise your search? So one of the things, let's go back and let's refine our search here. First thing I'm going to advise you to do is get rid of this one, that top category, and really focus in on biological sciences. Also, you're capable of having different searches for different things. So maybe for right now, you only want to look at research. Okay. So let's see if we've narrowed it down. Yep, 
Yep. And if we went back and we said only for gravity, it would take it down even further. The great thing about this is, is that you can save your search. You only have to go into pivot once. And as long as you save it and you click that box, every Monday you will receive an email if there is a new opportunity that meets your search criteria. Otherwise, you won't hear anything for a while. Okay, so I hope that you consider going into Pivot. It is something that once you've done it a few times, it is very intuitive, but I advise you to use the keywords. Don't just go typing in the words until you know how Pivot keys things. If you have any questions, I left some materials on the table out there. My bump in the Office for Research uh, and Sponsored Programs is at your disposal. He will gladly sit down with you and do this. And if you do this, it doesn't mean that you can't get the grants.gov, you know, things that we sent out. This is in addition to. But it allows you to be in the driver's seat and to run your own searches. Thank you. Are there any questions for Roxanne? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Try it and see if you like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Regarding the um, searching for investigators, mm -hmm. I search for people like that that have grants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
for those of you who have read the proposal, sometimes you see people doing things like bolding or making right. font different. Underlining. Or something. People really hate that if you do it very much. <laughs> it's very, very judicious, but that's a common mistake I see. <clears throat> I agree with that. People writing proposals. Bolding everything, you mean. Trivial things. You, yes. you want to do what Sergio says, but you have to not do it in a way that like, feels like marketing. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, <laughs> you got to convince him that you're unique, but, you know, to... Not, not because of the font. Right? Exactly. <laughs> um, so you see there are suggestions to use figures to convey your ideas. Uh, if you want the reviewer to read your argument, put it in the proposal, not the appendix. Uh, we're tempted to elaborate furiously and give detailed arguments and you put them in the appendices. Nobody will read the appendices. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. Uh, if I could please. add to that. Please. Have, ever, have you guys ever read a proposal and then you get to the appendix and you're like... Yeah, bring it close. Yeah, and, and you're seriously... Now you expect me to read this? I don't know about you, but it pisses me off. So, just like when you have figures and tables in your narrative, what do you do? You say C, figure, whatever, right? So if you have something in your appendix, you have to say C, appendix A and tell them why. So that way they're reading your appendix at the same time as they're reading your narrative. Or if it's that important, make your figure that clarifies everything into an image and embed it right there so they get that big picture. So if you have this fantastic figure that brings this all together, don't bury it in the appendix. Put it right there along with the specific aims or along with the theory, whatever you're talking about. So it's, they can digest all of that quickly in a picture. Sarah's Sarah? got a comment. Yes. Viewers are not required to read the appendices. Correct. The appendices are not a way to get around the page limits. Don't put anything in the appendices you want anybody to see. Did you get that on the Very good part? point. <laughs> yes, yes. Appendices, are, uh, right. NSF says that, you know, in, in, for example, where you have 15 pages to make your argument, any hyperlinks, any appendices are not part of the proposal, technically. So they don't have any, any, any obligation to read them. Um, one important argument that is underlined there is to read the, mo the most current guidelines for whatever proposal you're writing. You'll be amazed how, many, how often NSF, for example, the, uh, rewrites the, the, the guide for, for proposals with sometimes minor changes, but that, that affect tremendously your, your proposal. For the latest one is that your two-page uh, CV should not include the list of collaborators as they used to have. You need now to have a separate file for conflict of interest, uh, which in, you know, if you're at the last minute submitting that and all of a sudden you need that file, it's panic mode, I can tell you that. That section takes up a lot of space. That oh, absolutely. like to use, I assume that's why it's been Oh, absolutely, it's been, it's been removed. That space. <laughs> oh, that's right, that's right. But, but more than that, now they want to really have a file separate so they can actually check for conflict of interest on reviewing. So, um, any comments, questions? Yes, please. So, so you said don't fold, maybe put it in a figure, don't put it in the appendix, but how, I mean, most of these reviewers, senior faculty, let me say that here, uh, most of these reviewers, are, from what I understand, are not at all reading my proposal. Like maybe they glance over the specific aims, and then at NIH, they're voting on it, right? And, they, and that's, my score is determined by this, mostly my primary reviewers, but then the people on the outside. So what can you do to make your key points come across um, in a way that somebody glancing at the application will know what you're trying to say? Well, I mean, my suggestion will be to format your argument in such a way that you give basically like an introduction that puts it in context and gives the, the, the take-home message, if you will, right from the get-go. Um, so now, of course, you want to elaborate and give details in the, in the meat of it, but certainly you want to bring those things at, right at the beginning. Again, in NSF, and of course I'm biased because that's what I sort of write to, they, there, is a, there is a page, and Alan will talk about that, so where you have to summarize basically everything in one page. So a lazy reviewer, overworked reviewer, let me call it that, uh, will actually just read that and many times form an image, right or wrong, about the proposal, just that. Yes, Steve? I think the uh, primary reviewers, though, are your primary audience. Like at NIH reviews, anyway, two or three people read everything, 
And most, even if the other people have done more than skim, they often defer to the primary reviewer's judgments about the uh, ranking or the benefits of it. So I don't know that you can do anything to convince people who are going to skim it because they will assume the other people read it more and likely uh, go with their vote. So you're going to, the people who will be most influential will usually have read the whole thing. The other writing tip we, we uh, Bob, you referred to a little bit is, remember you're, when you write the proposal, you're writing it for the reviewers, and it is a bit of marketing in it. So the piece that may be the sexiest piece of your proposal, but you don't really care about, you may want to put up front. And make that the highlight of your proposal and make it the thing you talk most about, even though you know if you get funded, that's a very secondary aim, but you know from what's hot in your field that that's what's going to get people's attention. So remember your audience is just the reviewers, not anybody else, and you're marketing to them. To them, right. I think, Steve, that's a really important point. Not the thing I had to learn is you get really excited about some kind of the jitsu you're doing with your design, which is really hard to describe, and then you make that mistake of focusing on that part that may have taken you years to figure out how to deal with a confound, but that reviewer, you have that, I mean, it's, I used to do my abstract at the very end once my proposal was all done. Huge mistake. I, in the end, I was spending a good month just on the abstract. First, this to this point, because once you're in the reviews and you see what happens, you better have somebody hooked. With right from the beginning, minute, mm -hmm. looking at your proposal, and that's mm -hmm. going to be in the abstract. So that's all that work's going to get done. And if you say, "How do I do that?" It's with great difficulty. I mean, it's hard. That's why I brought the whole Zika thing up. You can connect to something that has that cachet of this is an issue that's you know current. And it gets you in the door of somebody who keeps you. Because that's what you want the, 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 your primary uh, readers to do, is keep reading. And they probably got the football game on, and they got a huge stack, and the kid's calling over here. So you want to keep them engaged somehow. And I think we're going to mention this a little bit later, too. But that, and Bob mentioned it before, the idea of um, having a review this prior to going in that's going to give you a sense of like what message did you get from me in, in one page what do you think is the most important or how do I make this more relevant to you who's maybe in a slightly different but related field and so having someone even if it's just that specific aims page or the abstract have a couple people colleagues read it um, to get that feedback so you're not waiting till the reviewer moment to get that feedback Very good. yes please this is not a writing question but a process question I think you mentioned earlier calling the program officer, and I'm curious about, I'm, this may be different for every grant, but to what extent that's appropriate either before you first submit an application or when you've been rejected and want to resubmit and want to revise it. You've got, in my own case, my co-author and I got sort of a very brief summary of feedback from the reviewers, but I don't know whether it's customary or Oh, I'm sorry. So I didn't. I didn't see you. I didn't see you, Sarah. Go ahead. Um, first of all, reviewers and program officers do read your proposals without the ball game and the kids and all the rest of it. <laughs> you can't just give everybody. I mean, you're all reviewers too. You do it well. We do it right. So let's cut everybody some slack. But um, calling the program officer. If you have a legitimate question is, you know, is this project appropriate for this panel? Do you have suggestions? Maybe there's a different panel that's more appropriate. There used to, there's always this idea that, well, we, get to, we need to get to know our program officers. No, you don't. If you're going to call and ask them something where they're going to refer to the the RFP and say, well, on page four, you'll see that. Yes. That's like your students that say, check the syllabus. You don't want them to know you for that. But having a, a real conversation, you know, reviewer so-and-so said this, and I was just wondering if you had more information on this maybe. The idea of reviewer four said this and they didn't read page five, not a good idea. Um, so having been a program officer and getting various calls, <coughs> 
<laughs> you you want to discuss science, and you're happy to right. discuss science, you're happy to discuss whether this is relevant to your program or not, or um, you know, those kinds of things, but just the check your syllabus kinds of things, not so much. Well, yeah, yes. I want to I want to no. offer a somewhat different. I think at NIH, where the people are professional program officers, I think it's maybe different. If you want to find a way, if you can, to get to know that person, because they're probably going to be in that position for a while. And I can't tell you how many times at a meeting, at a professional meeting, I just ran into my program officer, and we could have a conversation because. Knew this person, so I think that's worth making an effort. I, I understand you don't want to sound like you're just wasting somebody's time, but I think it's worth trying to get to know somebody because they actually can tell you about things, you know, that they're not going to you're not going to find out about otherwise. I think there's a lot of variability, which is the key that. Yeah. Some, I've had program officers at NIH and uh, IES who've read drafts before you submit and given tremendous yeah. feedback <laughs> and are, and are in down. the room when the discussion's going on and can tell you all kinds of, well, I know they just didn't emphasize this point, but this is really the reason you didn't get a favorable score. And they can help interpret that discussion for you very well. There are others who it's not worth your time calling them because they tend not to know what went on in the review meetings. They don't, they just keep pointing you back to the RFA and they say, well, did you read it? And you say, yeah. And they say, well, I don't know any more than what's on there. And I mean, it's so variable and it really, it's kind of an explore and learn who the person is and the potential value of connecting with them. Sarah. Yeah. I mean, I'll agree with all that. But again, if you're going to call somebody, have a legitimate sure. question, not something that can be addressed by reading the Yeah, you shouldn't be, shouldn't be asking a question that's in the RFP. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> if you want to talk about your research, that's a whole different matter. Oh, t completely. I mean, I, I guess my personal experience in that, in that regard is that I was sent to talk to the various program officers, and I thought it was very valuable. And part of the question was, you know, I have this research agenda. Does it identify? Does it fit in your program? Or they can direct you to another program. Those are really good questions to have to find the right program. Right. And, and, and I have to say that after that, of course, you get to know the person after a while. And, and there, there is a relationship. Even when you get a rejection after a proper cooling off period, <laughs> you call them back and they give you positive, you know, sort of useful feedback. So it's, I, it's definitely... I, Yes. If, if, I just had a couple of things. One, uh, foundations tend not to want to talk to you once the solicitation is open. So just be aware that there are differences between sure. uh, sponsors, as we said. Don't forget that the Air Travel Program will pay for you and three others to go and visit your sponsor if that is appropriate. But one of the things is in DC, you, you cannot tell your program officer can I come to you? I can get the university plane. Because they cannot advocate for that. What they can say, what you can say instead is, I'm going to be in DC, wink wink. Would you mind if I stop by? Then they can, because it's not a competitive advantage for those who do and don't have access to funds to come to DC. I also want to share a really quick story. I had a faculty member, I was sitting on uh, the phone with a program officer, and basically they were tearing this person this poor program officer, a new one. Did you realize that you have a typo here? And what is this name? Who the heck put together these guidelines? Blah, 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 blah. So then the faculty member submitted the grant, and I was on the phone call once again with the program officer, and guess what the program officer did to that faculty member who did not get funded? We spent 10 minutes going through every single typo in their proposal. <laughs> Payback. I think the other experience I've had in terms of when they've been helpful is when you're revising and resubmitting and you're sort of trying to figure out, do I go this way or this way, like with a methods decision, and both have advantages and disadvantages. If they were in the room during the reviews, they can sort of share with you, 
you know, yeah, take this approach, it might have this disadvantage, but you can, you know, address it in this way, or just give you a sense of the strength of a given <coughs> dissatisfaction of the reviewer and the, and the commentation from the panel. Um, any more comments? Um, I think the next slide in the spirit of time, I'm going to essentially skip it. Uh, Alan, do you want to go? I mean, I, I think the last bullet is good, and that, you know, really, you have to stay Make sure that everything is it's in your proposal. Colin. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Alan Showalter. I'm in uh, plant biology. So impact or significance of your work, um, this is paramount of importance in whether or not you're, you're funded. So there's usually a separate significance section that you'll have, but this impact significance should be right up front in your abstract or project summary. So if you do have the person that's only going to be glancing through proposals, this is definitely what they're reading. So you got to catch them here and then catch them inside the grant as well. So reinforce these ideas. So the first uh, question really summarizes this whole area of impact significance. How are you contributing to your field and to society? And you really have to lay it out in terms of how this research you're planning to do is going to move your field ahead and it's going to help society. So that takes different forms that you can read here. I'm more familiar with NSF and it's so important to NSF that the project summary has these two specific sections, intellectual merit and broader impacts, and you have to address them and there's a specific place card that you put in your answers here. So that is mainly how you're judged by NSF in terms of whether or not you get funded. How well do you address these two areas of intellectual merit, which is your contribution to your discipline, and broader impacts, which is what you're doing in terms of contribution to society. Oops. <clears throat> So that's uh, sort of the first uh, bullet point there. And then something that Bob uh, had mentioned initially, you can also include when you're talking about the intellectual merit. You know, this is no time uh, to be modest. You have to try to sell yourself and say you are the best person to do this research, and this is important research in my field and in society. This uh, next point about uh, wow factor, or a word that I sometimes get jaded seeing this idea of transformative research, but nonetheless, it is a fact that people are looking for something that's going to distinguish your proposal. We've heard that several times today. So I've actually seen the word wow factor in one of the reviews. We got rejected, and the PI that uh, was on this grant, I was a co-PI, came into my office, and he was so demoralized by the wow factor, wow factor, what is this? You do have to get them excited about your work, and you have to distinguish it. Um, so in fact, this wow factor is important to address. OK, and, and the other two points were also, uh, I think, uh, mentioned before in terms of how well organized, what's your plan, and do you have the necessary resources special collections, et cetera, to address this work. Broader impacts, now you're looking at what contribution is your work going to give to society. And that means training students and educational aspects, as well as how this research is going to move ahead something in society. <clears throat> so don't forget about teaching, training, learning. Uh, we certainly can play up the undergraduate students. Sometimes, for especially NSF, I'm not familiar with some of the other agencies, you talk about underrepresented groups. It's always useful to sell Appalachian undergraduate students here as a special group that we're able to give training to. Um, so that was the second point, the underrepresented. At least at NSF, that's quite important. How is it going to help infrastructure, research infrastructure, educational infrastructure? Uh, at our university and access 
for opportunities for students. How are you going to get this information out? So we say it's going to be important for society. How is society going to know about it? How are you going to publicize what you've done? Do you have to talk about that as well? What are these benefits? Spell them out. And there's some examples that you can follow up on if you'd like to look further. OK, so Julie, I think you have one here. Any questions about that? You guys want to talk about it? Yes, please. Um, I was curious about the um, selling yourself idea and trying to determine where is the most appropriate place within the context of the um, proposal itself. Is that occurring in the like CV um, or a bio statement, or should that be, you know, laced somewhere else as well? I think all the places that you can slip it in to reinforce it, the better. But um, certainly in your CV, you'd be mentioning that. But there might be uh, in many proposals, there's and we'll be talking about that preliminary data, pilot data that you've inc incorporated. This is a good place to show you're an expert in this. You've been accumulating information. You've been studying this problem. So put it there. Slip it into the project summary, how you have made already contributions, and now you're going to build on them. So the more places that you can include it and slip it in, it's, it's sort of like a Jedi mind trick, I think. You know, I am the best person to do this research. I am the best person. And it, it will be taken up, I think. Resources is the other place that you can put it in as well, sort of to show what capacities you have in your lab or staffing, that sort of thing. Um, I'm Julie Owens from Psychology. Um, so in terms of thinking about staffing and uh, team development, um, at the proposal stage, you've got some decisions to make, right? So if you're a new investigator, the reviewers are not just reviewing you as an investigator, but they're thinking about your, the strength of your whole team. And so who is your team? And you have a decision, for example, um, to bring on consultants, or you can bring on co-investigators. And so when you think about um, a consultant, it might be someone who has just a narrow area of expertise that you need for your project. It could be statistical or analytical, or it could be conceptual, theoretical, but it's um, that they're not going to be, you know, a, a, another investigator, but putting in a small piece. So, for example, when we were developing um, a professional development and consultation package for teachers to implement classroom intervention strategies, um, the, the two PIs at the sites, we were developing all the content, but we brought on a consultant who had expertise in the measurement of our dependent variable, a particular type of teacher skill. So she was there at you know, all of our decisions about measurement and contributed to that, um, but was not you know, like an extra site PI. Um, however, if you're a junior folk person and you're thinking maybe I need to show more capacity in my team, you may want to think about bringing on another co-investigator who not only brings content and expertise and contribution to the science, but you can also then leverage and say, you know, there's grantsmanship and, and mentorship that I'm going to get about budgets, about staffing, about all these other aspects of the proposal or of the grant once you have it. Um, for us in psychology and other social sciences, you may be thinking about are you doing a single site project versus a cross site project? And there's certainly advantages and disadvantages to each. So if you have cross site, you yourself only have to get half the sample, <laughs> you know, and it might bring diversity in terms of we're in a rural place and our other place has urban and suburban access, or maybe there's diversity issues that you don't have in your site. So two sites really build a full proposal. Um, but you also need to be thinking about you have to put in twice as much time now to make sure that there's consistency across sites and staffing and training staff and data collection and all of those sorts of, you know, integrity to whatever process you're using. And so there's uh, advantages and disadvantages to that. And then also... Um, speaking from experience, I've had wonderful cross-site collaborators and then I've had challenging <laughs> cross-site collaborators. And so you want to think about that collaborator uh, and maybe connect with them on something else prior to embarking in a three to five year project with them. Um, you have some decisions about project managers. So, uh, you know, it might be a graduate student. Certainly they are the least expensive in terms of the budget. Um, and it's a wonderful training opportunity for them and mentoring opportunity for you. 
but at the same time, graduate students have competing demands. So they have classes, they have, you know, at least in psychology, they have their clinical work. So um, it is not the only priority they have. Whereas if you hire a project manager and that is their full-time job, then you know that that's their priority all the time. Um, you might think about postdoctoral fellows separate from staff, right? They're going to be possibly more invested in the science than a staff member you may hire, and you know they're on their own trajectory. But you do also need to think about making sure you are balancing time and mentoring them and helping them achieve their goals for the next step of their career. Um, and then regardless of how you build your team, making sure that uh, when you are writing your budget and budget narrative that each of these people have unique roles. So I have certainly seen reviews come back and they say, well, there's this person on there and they're a senior person, but they're only on there for 2%. So what are they really doing is this sort of tokenism that, you know, the reviewers aren't buying it. Um, or if you have a lot of different levels of staff sort of segmenting out, what are they doing so that it's clear that you need each of those levels? Uh, questions about staffing, budget decisions? Yeah. Is it, is it possible to establish too good of a team as a junior investigator? Like people, like without you, the project is uh, just as good? <laughs> uh, I think you want to make sure that you convey that you're critical and key to the project and the science and that they are there to support you and, and make it stronger. Um, so if you're questioning that, then I think you want to dovetail back and make sure you've sold yourself and your pile of data. But, you know, so, but if that's to a training grant, essentially, then yeah. that's fine. Yeah. So it depends on the what the funding is for and your role. Other questions about staffing or budgets related to that? You want to say something about yeah? So Julie mentioned postdoc. So NSF, this is a one of the important sections that you'll have to add. And there's some others, so there's data management and for NSF uh, postdoc mentoring plans. You want to make sure you address these special sections and don't say, oh, well, that's not so important. Everything's important. Everything's important. So don't give the panel an excuse to dump your proposal because maybe you did not do a good job explaining how you're going to be mentoring your postdoc or how you're going to be handling your data. So don't think any part of the proposal is unimportant and should not be given uh, attention. And if you have trouble finding documents like this, we are trying to assemble a, a grant library that hopefully will be available for too long. Or as, as Rox mentioned, if you want one of these grants, you can contact her and she'll see if she can mediate that process. But why not just go directly to the person? So don't be afraid to ask other people here on campus about their experience. I mean, that's what we have to sometimes do, is tap into one, one another's experience. And don't be afraid to cold email, cold call somebody and, and see if you could strike up a conversation. And could I see your grant? Or could you explain to me what your postdoc mentoring plan looked like? So that might be people in your department, or it might be people in the college, or another college. These are our colleagues. And uh, I think most of the time, we do have good interactions. You may encounter someone that's not going to be so forthcoming, but I think for the most part, our colleagues are a good resource and don't underutilize them. Yeah, I think uh, in our own professional development, we get a lot of uh, mentorship around the science and around the proposal writing and grant writing and all of that. And I don't think, at least from my own experience, we get a lot of mentoring on the budget side and the financial side. And so um, I guess the message here is you don't have to do this alone, uh, that there are resources to help you with the budget. Um, I know sometimes budgets can be sensitive for folks to share, but within your own departments or even talking with Roxanne, there are budget uh, samples that you can use. And even if people don't want to share their salaries per se, even learning, well, you know, how much did you put in in terms of percentages for your consultant, for your co-I, for, you know, the graduate students and things like that. So. Um, a lot of times, because we have the resources in the research division or some folks who have grants managers in their own department, 
you know, you can communicate to them in English <laughs> what it is that you want. Like, I want to hire these level and these this many people, and then they will put it into a spreadsheet that has you know all of those numbers and the amount it costs, and then you can play around with it. You know, of course, put everything in that you want, and then it'll be a hundred thousand over, and then you start realizing where you scale back. Uh, but it's really helpful to get those spreadsheets. Um, they're just really useful in terms of where, when you have to cut. Um, things to be thinking about is, you know, are you going to take academic release? So that's your academic salary and um, whether it's a percentage of your salary or whether it's a flat rate. Are you preferring to take summer salary that you are earning you know, if you're a nine month contract and you can earn up to 30 your salary in the summer? Um, if you're hiring folks, don't forget that the benefits are expensive. So if you want to hire somebody whose salary is $45,000, it's going to cost you and your budget $65,000 for the benefits and, and be thinking about that. And, and those kinds of decisions can come into play. Are you taking a full-time staff member, a part-time staff member, a graduate student, and so forth? Um, as you're thinking about equipment and supplies, don't just think about your one-time costs, but do you have maintenance costs that you want to build in? Or if you're building technology in a website, is there ongoing supports for those types of technology? And don't forget to build those in across the years. Um, it's a sensitive topic, but it, you shouldn't do it in isolation. There's resources, again, that, uh, like Alan said, there's colleagues in our college that can, can help you navigate this. Questions about budget? I have a question for everybody. Do you want to ask for too much or too little? How many people say ask for too little because it'll show that you're on the cheap and you know they won't think that you're greedy? Raise your hands. Anybody think too little is a good thing? Good, it's not. <laughs> what it tells the program officer is, is that you do not understand the scope of your work and that if we give you that money, you will not be capable of doing your project. So I'm not necessarily advocating for ask for too much. What I'm advocating is for ask for what you need and then argue it. And there's just other resources here. I mean, some agencies are really asking you to get down to the mileage amount for local travel or per diem amount. So, you know, we have resources and web pages for that. Uh, let's see, pilot data. Um, we've talked a little bit about this. I mean, not it's not necessary for all... Um, proposals, but even for those that it's not necessary, if you have it, it can be helpful. <laughs> um, but you do need to use it in a way that's relevant to your research question. So just saying I've done this, this, and this, if it's not well connected, may not be of help. And so making sure that uh, you're, you're highlighting it and in specific connection to your specific aims. Um, so as Rox talked about, there's internal supports that can help you. Um, you know, gain pilot data. We're going to leave some time at the end today to talk about uh, a new research enhancement initiative that we're taking in the college. Um, Can I add two cents about preliminary data? Yeah. Nothing will kill a good proposal faster than bad preliminary data. So if you include preliminary data, which is great, that's good. But do not say n equals one. Okay, or if you have bar graphs, put your standard deviations and make sure that the trends that you're showing in your preliminary research actually drive with your objectives and your hypothesis. I cannot tell you how many times we read proposals where the preliminary data runs counter to the argument of the proposal. Yep. I know I've certainly seen proposals, though, where someone says that can't be done. And preliminary data is extremely useful in that yeah. circumstance. Yeah. So literally, if you don't have anything, it's easy for a reviewer just to dismiss it. And, and that undercuts your advocates in a review panel. So, mm -hmm. Because if you say, well, you say they did it. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. So think of that as proof of concept, yeah. proof of you as an investigator, and then proof of feasibility, that I am capable of getting the sample size in this setting, I'm capable of pulling off this in the time frame I'm proposing, those sorts of things it can be helpful. Um, data management, I know Alan had mentioned, you know, you might have to have a specific data management plan for specific agencies, um, you know, the expected data formats, data sharing, um, practices and policies. Some of the agencies require that you discuss how, if you have two co-PIs, you are going to resolve disagreements if they occur. <laughs> answer it. If it's in the proposal and it's part of the RFA, you need to answer it. Um, 
So there's links for that. And then also thinking about if you are collecting confidential data, um, you know, one of the new resources uh, in the last few years that we've acquired at OU is the Research Electronic Data Capture or REDCAP system. Steve Evans in the audience has a 1804 grant that has allowed us to expand that across colleges. Um, and it is a HIPAA compliant, confidential way to access um, participants through survey and you can do multiple time points. It's, there's a lot of sophistication to that. So if you're interested in that, there's a website at OU where you can get training. Uh, also just thinking about storage issues, you may need to talk about password protecting master files that have IDs and names and storing consent separately from the data, those sorts of things if you're dealing with confidential data. Hi, my name is Steve Miner. I'm from the History Department and I'm the representative of the humanities on this panel. And as such, I felt like I was the three-eyed frog. Um, I learned a lot about uh, how the sciences go about applying for grants, uh, but the humanities do as well. And so the, the element that I was given to talk about today, I think makes a good deal of sense, which is mentoring or networking. When we had a lot of talks about this, whether or not what part networking and what part mentoring ought to play in this. I was somewhat skeptical, thinking that mentoring sounded like it infantilized people, that they have to go to somebody who is a senior scholar and ask them, sit at their feet and get their ideas. Uh, we changed the wording to say it was really peer review and peer consultation, because even somebody who's a senior scholar can get an awful lot from passing their ideas past people who have an expertise in their field or an expertise in, an, in a nearby field. There is an enormous value to having a colleague or even a set of colleagues read and critique your work, uh, particularly people who don't necessarily understand or accept your initial assumptions. Um, I'm one of my colleagues here, Catherine, right over here, is in a reading group that, uh, that I'm in, and we pass our work and our proposals to one another and have done for years, and it's been one of the most useful things I've been involved in, in a scholarly sense, in my entire time at Ohio University. Uh, my own expertise is Soviet history. There's really nobody else on campus, with a couple of exceptions, that have any expertise in that at all. But we do have people who write history more generally, and politics more generally, and do historical subjects. And a fresh set of eyes reading something can be enormously valuable, uh, particularly in, in the humanities where your, your initial assumptions you may think are just fine, and somebody may come along and say, well, actually, you're, you've got a bias here and it shows. Uh, you're arguing something here that uh, not everybody can accept. They can also see the structural failures. You do logic leaps when you're writing in, in isolation where you think that somebody is following your train of argument and they're not. And uh, so they can clear up your, your writing. We wanted to create a culture of pure comment and critique at Ohio University. Uh, Bob mentioned that we live in the Midwest, and that's not really the way things are frequently done. I study Eastern Europe. Uh, Eastern Europe has a very different culture. If they think you're an idiot, they'll tell you that. Um, well, we're not trying to foster that sort of frankness, uh, but there's a refreshing quality to it where people actually do critique what you write and don't just say, yeah, that, that, that's okay, that's good. You, you can change a few paragraphs here. Uh, it, where they actually engage the ideas and critique them in a, in a fair-minded sense, or at least ask the questions that are going to be asked by reviewers. Because you're sending this frequently, and, and it's true in the humanities, you're going to be sending this proposal to people who aren't necessarily directly in your field. And they're reading all sorts of different proposals in the humanities, and it has to be clear as a bell to them, and it doesn't have to sound flaky. And so having somebody read this and, and, and critique it in a serious fashion is extremely helpful. Consider peer consultants in your department, in other departments at another university. That was one of the things we, wanted, we talked about as well. It doesn't have to be a senior uh, a colleague. It doesn't even have to be somebody in your department. There may be somebody who has an expertise in another department, and the College of Arts and Sciences, and Brian in particular, will act as a clearinghouse to say, look, there are people on campus who have similar interests. I know you don't want to be a gatekeeper, and you don't want to say, don't work with X because he or she is a nut. But nonetheless, to, to be a resource, to say there are people who, what's that? He is not from Eastern Europe. Uh, give him to me, I'll say it, right? Uh, no, but uh, another thing, too, is picking somebody who is, has the right temperament. They're, 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 that's an ineffable thing. You can't define that, and we can't define it here. But that's a very important thing. But talk to Brian. He's a resource in this. Okay, responding to reviews. 
Nobody likes reviews. Nobody likes bad ones. Don't get discouraged. Don't, don't uh, uh, give up. Persist. Don't respond at once. Boy, this is something that you can underline and underline again. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, when he wrote letters that, he, to, uh, that were harsh letters or difficult letters, used to write them and he'd get his, his blood up and then he'd put it in the drawer and he'd never send it till the next day at, at the earliest. That's a very, very good idea. Let things cool off. Sometimes just the act of writing an angry response can get things out of your system. But it's very useful to have somebody read anything before you respond. Uh, very useful indeed, because I don't know about you, but uh, I love—I get a little bit fond of my phrases, the nasty little zingers you can put in. Uh, those are out of place, and and uh, a fresh set of eyes will say, "Look, you're you're not going to win any friends this way. Your your attempt is to, your your point is to persuade. It's not to win. Uh, they have the money. You don't. You want it. You have to persuade them. So take a breath. Read the reviews several times before you respond." We coming back to another thing, talk to a program officer. Uh, nobody wants to, in a program officer, nobody wants to be phoned up and say, well, you guys weren't really clear what you said. But you can, if you have very specific questions, phone up a, a program officer and say, well, what, what's, what's going on here? Uh, what, are, what are the ideas that are, that are, that are at fault? Um, and as, as I said, I'll underline it again because I mentioned it. Don't send it on the day you receive it. Yeah. consensus about how many times to resubmit like once sure twice okay should we be getting to like 10 times assuming the program <laughs> officer says yes you're it you're applying to the right type of funding the right panel etc i we talked we did yeah we did talk about this and and thought that you know if, if you are doing the same thing over again and it get you get to the third time there's a probably you really ought to rethink but i i, I don't know that there's a set thing. Uh, if you can fiddle with it enough so that you're actually changing it, then that might, might be an excuse for persisting. But if, if it's really coming up dry every time, and it goes three times, maybe. But what, was that not what we talked about, about three times? Uh, more or less, but, but I think Sarah's advice is a good one. This is a good question for the program yeah. officer. And, and also just looking at your, rev your reviews from those grant uh, that, that you have submitted. Is there progress being made? Or are you getting the same comments? Yeah. If you're getting the same comments, then things have not substantially changed. But again, the program officer is a perfect uh, way to approach this issue. I, 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 have I have a point to make, and that is that uh, you should remember that the, that the program officers are the conveyors of bad news, but not the generators of bad news. Right. So you should really keep that in mind whenever you talk to them. You want, you want their input as to understand the reviews, but they're not the ones that give you the bad reviews. So you should really keep that in mind. And you shouldn't harangue them either. That's well, awesome. Awesome. All right, and, and okay. you might be going back to that program with a different grant proposal, so you don't want to alienate the program director, right? So I think always treat them with respect, but go in with sometimes tough questions, but with the res respect that they deserve. Were you next? Now, there is a circumstance where sometimes you will get a change of program officer, and then you want to establish a new relationship, because sometimes a particular project will not work with a particular program officer, but with uh, changing of the guard, sometimes you will get a fresh read. I think we've hit this pretty clearly, uh, thinking about your reviewers and thinking about making your project feasible, defensible, innovative, impact, all of that. Um, so I guess in trying to wrap up, we do have a top 10 list. Uh, be persistent. <laughs> we started with that. Um, talk to the program officer, but have good questions when you do so. Do not write in isolation. Use peer consultants in your department, outside of the department. Uh, generate a good idea. Convince them that you're the best person to do the work. Read other successful grants. There's lots of information you can gain from that, reading all parts of the RFA, because things change year to year, and you don't want to, they're looking for reasons to you know, discount you, so don't be in that group. Make a strong argument and sell it. Sell it in the first page, sell it again, sell it in a figure. Uh, we talked about reading the current guidelines, and there's a theme here. <laughs> be persistent. 
Um, I think if you talk to anybody in the room who's had uh, success in grant funding, um, the surefire way to not get a grant is to not submit. So, got to get them into play. I'd like to add one thing. If ever you have the opportunity to sit on a grant panel, take it. The best way to learn how to write a grant is to watch somebody else's grant be triaged. Um, well, um, I hope that we've answered uh, all of your questions. Um, if, if there are any, of course, you know, we, we're always open to emails or whatever. Um, we wanted to uh, announce a couple of activities that, that uh, one, there will be a, a follow-up workshop uh, with the idea of making it more uh, specific to different agencies. That would be uh, a day to be determined in the spring semester. So if uh, you have a specific agency questions, please let us know. Send it, you will get a survey after this, so that uh, that will be an opportunity for you to let us know so that we can again tailor this second workshop. Um, and the other thing is that uh, the college is about to announce, and you'll get it in your mailbox uh, within the week, uh, it, uh, a program of research enhancement funds. We kind of alluded to before, uh, before in that the college wants to encourage, in collaboration as to say with the Office of Research, uh, they, they, they want to encourage uh, peer review, right? Peer um, critique of proposals. And, and again, the idea is not necessarily to get a, a more senior member of your department. I mean, it could be in a different department. It could be your peer, really lateral peer, that, but however has experience with the agency you're trying to reach. And, and the idea is that um, you will get details, but, but the, um, this will uh, give funds for those proposals who get submitted to, again, get preliminary data and, and whatnot. But the, the main purpose of this program is to um, foster you know, it, uh, in, uh, intellectual cross-pollination, really. And so uh, I think we're, it'd be very exciting. The other, the other thing that you must have received an announcement for is that there, are, there will be book writing and, and grant proposal learning communities. Uh, that email came out last week, just came out last week. Uh, if you didn't see it, you hit the delete button too soon, please let us know. If it look in your spam filter, uh, but let us know. There, there is certainly... Uh, I think the college, Bob, is trying to promote uh, activities and just make it easier for all of us, and especially those of you who are just starting. So do I hit them? Yeah, Please, I any comments? We, we also just wanted to get a little input about that. Okay. As, as a committee, we've been working on these different initiatives, so grant workshops um, and working on the research enhancement idea. Um, and there was this idea of, um, you know, is there room for learning community, communities for research. And so I know like in, in my center, we have a weekly writing group. And just as Steve was talking about the benefits of collaborative writing and peer critique, we have benefited so much. My, my own writing has benefited. My students' writing has benefited. I think our what we put out is stronger prior to peer review. So I guess our discussion amongst our committee was, is there an interest in that either within other departments, within other centers, across departments. I mean, like Steve's collaboration is across three different departments. Is that right? Three more. Um, so I guess we're just interested in any reactions to that or ideas. So if we wanted to help the college promote this more or make it more useful to people, what would that look like? Yeah. So you can, you can write now in this, in this call for proposals last week, you can basically write a plan for how you're going to put a group together and, and go with it. So... And, By all means. And if you're having trouble finding partners, then let me know, let Brian know, and we'll, we'll try to help. Because I think that's one of the challenges sometimes. You might be, a, you don't know if anybody else is interested, and so we can, we can try to do. And the other thing I want to say is, it's, it's very useful, and this is in my lab, we used to do things, and it was very insider kind of group, and it worked. But I've also seen this work in very diverse groups. So I don't think it, there's a value in having people ask questions when they're confused about your writing. And that's, to me, the fundamental thing, having a certain spirit of trying to be constructive 
but then just ask questions. Well, I didn't understand this. So it's not like you've got to find somebody with this very narrow expertise to be helpful in, in one of these kinds of groups. And I, I think it's important to realize that the time to ask for advice is not two days before the proposals do, <laughs> right? So, and that's part of what's embedded in this research enhancement plan for advanced peer consultation, not just, oh, the week before or the day before. You really want to be thinking about this proposal way in advance of the submission date and getting your advice way in advance, not last minute, even though I know that's human nature and how we all sometimes operate. So we're trying to change that. Alan, can I just, we've got senior folks here. How far in advance of submitting a proposal, a big proposal, do you start? I used to meet with six months for NIH. Well, I'm just talking about <laughs> setting it up. I don't know, Julie, sure. how long? Yeah, sure. a good six months. You start thinking about it. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Alan, six months is typical. Yeah, three to six months, I'd say. Steve? Yeah, three to six months. Era? I'm always working on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nancy? Three to six One of the things, though, that I would like to encourage you when you start thinking about a funding agency, especially if you haven't worked with that funding agency before, is to go out and look at what they call their mission statement or their roadmap. For NSF, basically, it's science for science sake. But for NIH, that's not true. They have a roadmap. For the Department of Energy, they have a roadmap. Certainly for foundations, they do. And by asking what do they consider the broader impacts, essentially, You'll, you'll write a much stronger proposal. And I think that what I tell people is writing is not the hardest part of writing the proposal. It's deciding what you're going to write. That's what takes a lot of brain cells and a lot of time to sort of mull it over. Well, are I there... Have, I have one other... Please, sorry. please, please, no. We're still... I haven't got a chance to do this in four years. <laughs> I had a slide that I used to use, I can't remember if it was in the ones I shared, that um, had to do with foundation support. And so I used the Community of Science database mm -hmm. to identify a foundation that supported uh, programs in nutrition for children. So I was telling you I was doing research on basically pickiness, food finickiness. And I thought this would be great for children. So I uh, wrote a, an email to a contact person and, um, as you know, said, explained how I thought this was important. And I got back an, an email that said, thank you very much for, for uh, your interest. Um, the foundation is interested in providing nutritious and healthy food to children. We have no interest in the spoiled children of today who should just eat whatever they're given. <laughs> so I didn't write a proposal to that organization, and, but the point I want to make is almost certainly this was a family member on a board who was making decisions about those, you know, uh, about interest, as opposed to NIH or DOE or these big federal funders. And so for some of you who, who are in the humanities, who very much more likely would send to a foundation, that's why you call the program officer if you can. Oftentimes very challenging. It might be a part-time person, but you have to know the funder in that way. So you don't need to go through a lot of the elaborate steps that you might for an NSF or an NIH proposal if you're working with a foundation. So that's the knowing the funder. I mean, it really goes back to, to having some sense, doing the intelligence to figure out who the funder is, as opposed to what I've seen from, from people. They write a proposal, and then they just spew it out anything that even looks remotely uh, relevant. And they're not successful. Yeah, Steve. Steve. Yes. Just following up on these comments, there's a, in terms of how much you connect with the mic. mission and the latest goals of the agency, I think that differs somewhat. Like at, at IES, the, Depart the, at the IES, the Department of Education Research arm, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they, the ranking you get at the review committee is not altered. There's no counsel or anything that alters that or lifts the priority of some applicants over others. And most reviewers, 
our university and medical center faculty and aren't as in tune with the latest missions. So it's good to have it in there, but it's more important to have it in there, like at NIH, when it goes from the review committee to a council, because they reach down and pull some up that resonate better with the aims and missions and priorities that they've stated. And that's where connecting with those aims can make, uh, I think, a much bigger difference. So that's, that's there knowing the review process, too, yeah. if you can. Yeah, that, that's really important, knowing the review process. I mean, when you come to the internal awards, one of the things that we have is everybody assumes that there are going to be experts from their field sitting on the panel. And I said, did you look at the Council for Re you know, Sco Research, Scholarship, and Creative Activity? We have artists and scientists and social scientists. You, know, you have to be able to talk to a lay audience. Because quite honestly, nothing pisses off academics more than making them feel stupid. Um, but then there are times where you know that you're going to get more of a technical review, and then you can, you know, go into the technical language a little bit more. So you need to understand who's reviewing, you know, your proposals. And there are even times, like foundations, where they will tell you exactly who is on the review committee. It doesn't mean you go and call them and try and make best buddies with them, but it might mean that, you know, you do go and look up what their interests are and see if there's anything that you can advocate and what you're doing in their interests. Yeah. Any more questions, comments, folks? Yeah, I wonder if, if any of the more senior people have anything they'd like to add to our top ten list of, of secrets to help uh, the more junior people along. Did we hit it all, or is there something you want to pass on for the more experienced people? The only thing I might throw out is if you... Uh, if you're generally applying to, to NSF and if something's not working for you, go out and beat the bushes and look at, you know, get on to pivot, look for foundations, look for smaller grants, um, and don't get caught in a trap of that you only need funding from one particular agency. Um, look at six or seven or eight or nine and diversify sort of your, your portfolio, if you will, of grantsmanship to be successful. This actually goes to the point that you raised. How many times do you try something? Maybe only three times at the same place, but it might go well at a different grant agency because it has different interests. Yeah. That didn't work. So there will be a red cap survey. So give us good critique. Let us know what was good about this, what wasn't. If we want to repeat this next year with uh, you know, a different group of folks, what would we do? Any feedback, we welcome. <laughs> And we'll, we'll try not to be too upset by the reviews, right? <laughs> yeah. We'll sleep on them and then write a rebuttal.